What's up, Gimme Liberty fans? We have chapter two of the fourth edition today. This one is focusing on English colonization from 1607 to 1660. Before I begin, make sure if, if you want this PowerPoint, fill in the blanks guide for this video or any other resources, check out the description and go to apushreview.com. I got everything there for you. All right, let's get going. So we have England in the New World. The Church of England was established by this dude, Henry VIII, after he split from the Catholic Church church and he was the leader of both england and the church of england also known as the anglican church now before england comes to the americas they take over ireland and they conquered and subdued ireland through military action and killing of civilians they treated them very very harshly and they will take a similar approach with the native americans in north america so England settled in North America later than the Spanish and the Portuguese. So they're kind of latecomers to the party in the Americas. Roanoke was the first civilization that was founded. This is known as the Lost Island in 1586. Although there's new evidence that has come out that they think they may know what happened to these people. Years later, when they went to this colony, all they found was Croatoan carved into a tree and the people were gone. And there's this mystery as to what happened to them. All right, spreading Protestantism. In 1588, England defeated the Spanish Armada, this gigantic navy, and England emerged as a naval power. And here is a route of the Spanish Armada during the battle. And England sought to bring Protestantism, not Catholicism, to the New World. Spain and France were bringing Catholicism. England's like, you know what? We're going to bring Protestantism. So America appealed to overpopulated England because there were many economic difficulties. There was not a lot of land and there was a ton of people without jobs in England. So America seemed like a good place for economic opportunities. In England, we have the enclosure movement, which is when landowners enclosed or fenced off their land, basically put up fences and said, get off my lawn. And this led to many people losing farmland. If you lose farmland, you don't have a source of living back then. So many of them pack up their bags and move to America. And the New World appealed to many poorer people in England because there's a possibility of owning land. Now, unlike Spain and France, very important to know this is start. Absolutely know this. You write an essay about colonization of European countries. You better include this. England sent men, women, and children to the Americas. Spain and France predominantly just sent men, and they did so in smaller numbers than the English. Now, we're going to talk about the Chesapeake. This is Virginia and Maryland. Know those two colonies. They focused on tobacco and indentured servants early on. What's an indentured servant, you ask? Well, it is somebody who comes to the Americas in exchange for working five to seven years. And here is a contract of an indentured servant. So usually they work five to seven years in exchange for getting a ticket to come over to the Americas. However, roughly half of them lived to see freedom at the end of their contracts. Now, owning land was associated with liberty in England and this allowed men to vote. And with large amounts of land came the need for labor. So we're going to see initially it's going to be indentured servants and there will be a switch we'll talk about in the next chapter to African slavery. A proprietor was somebody who received a royal grant of land from the king, such as William Penn, who founded Pennsylvania, and Calvert, or Lord Baltimore, in Maryland. All right, unlike the Spanish or French, the English did not seek to intermarry with natives. They sought to displace them, so they had much more... Their relationship with natives was defined more by conflict. Land was gained from natives through treaties after military defeat. Rarely did they buy land. And the English displace natives more than any other European country. They do not intermarry and establish new cultures with Native Americans as the French and Spanish did. So European goods that transform native life, iron, metal, guns in particular, and horses as well. Men hunted more beaver for the fur trade, which was very important in Europe. There's a very high demand for, for fur, especially beaver fur. And alcohol wreaked havoc and disrupted Native American life. Now, European expansion into native land transformed native lifestyle. Cornfields were affected by cattle and pigs, and forests were cut down for lumber. So, not only are natives losing land, but the land is being transformed as well. Okay, so we have the Jamestown colony. This is the first permanent 
establishment. This is in Virginia in 1607. So England initially, they sought to gain silver and gold, just like the Spanish did. However, there was not silver and gold there. So they quickly turned to agriculture, and in particular... Yeah, you know it, tobacco. So we have the starving time in Jamestown. This is a really brutal winter between 1609 and 1610 in which most colonists died. John Smith emerges as a leader and he says, listen, you're not working, you're not eating, you're starving, bro. So he put, made sure a lot of people were working. So the headright system was created and this allowed 50 acres of land given to anybody who paid for an indentured servant to come over. So this is going to benefit the wealthy and give them more land. In 1619, we have two very unique events in the history of America. One, we have the creation of the House of Burgesses, which was the first representative government in colonial America. Even though this was just limited to landowners, this was very democratic for its time. And the other event is the first ship containing Africans arrived. So we see on one hand, the establishment of representative government. And on the other hand, we see the beginning of slavery. Now, the English in Jamestown initially tried to convert natives to Christianity. And John Rolfe, not John Smith Disney, he married Pocahontas. And this really was a rarity in English counties because they did not intermarry with natives. Okay, in 1622, Powhatan's brother, he attacked settlers in Virginia, killing one quarter of them. So Virginia saw to, as the book says, rid the savages to gain the free range of the country. So we have the first of many conflicts. And Native Americans were defeated, and they were first forced to move further west. This will be a trend throughout American history. Now, we have the emergence of a tobacco colony. And tobacco brought wealth to planters and the English. And especially English in the forms of customs duties or tariffs. Now, tobacco exhausted the land, which led to expansion, which led to conflicts with natives, and this would repeat itself over and over. Few towns allowed plantation owners to dominate politics in the South. And in the 17th century, most immigrants were indentured servants to the Chesapeake. So throughout the 1600s, most of the immigrants were indentured servants and won't be slaves until later in the 1600s, which we'll see in the next chapter. Now, on a side note, in a 2005 movie, The New World, one of my favorite actors, Christian Bale, played John Rolfe, the guy who introduced tobacco to the Chesapeake. He goes on to play Batman. Do you think he was running around like, where's the tobacco? Where? That's my Batman impression. Sadly, this will not be the last Christian Bale Batman impression you will hear in this series. All right, women in the family, men, highly outnumbered women in the Chesapeake in the 17th century, and married women were entitled to some land in the event of her husband's death, but married women enjoyed few rights in the English colonies. That's something we talked about in the last chapter video. In Maryland, Maryland also thrived on tobacco, and remember that is a part of the Chesapeake. In 1632, the, it was established as a proprietor colony to Cecilius Calvert, and he had full power over the land. And here he is, the Lord Baltimore. Now, Calvert was Catholic, unlike other English counties, which were predominantly Protestant. And he hoped Maryland would be a safe haven for Catholics. They were outnumbered by, by Protestants, and he hoped to establish a religious safe haven for them. And the death rate in the Chesapeake was astronomically high. About half the people lived to be 20. You know what that means? That means they had midlife crises when they were 10 years old. Can you imagine having a midlife crisis when you were 10 years old? That's insane, right? And 50% died by 20. All right, let's talk about Puritanism. Puritans wanted to purify the Anglican Church of Catholic rituals. They did not want to break away or start a new one. That is separatist. They believed in predestination, the idea brought by this dude, John Calvin, which said that before you are born, God already determined whether you would go to heaven or hell. John Winthrop was a key figure for Puritans, and he gave a very famous speech you should be familiar with, a city upon a hill, he said. He said New England or Boston should be the city upon a hill in which all the rest of the world would look up to. Basically, you want to create a model society for the rest of the world. They did not extend religious freedom to others. Even though they were denied religious freedom, really, in England, they did not want to extend it to others. And they established a community of like-minded individuals. Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson, these were two people that challenged Puritan ideals. So they were banished from Massachusetts Bay. They were sent on over to Rhode Island. 
Now, liberty meant the ability to establish churches and govern and not have their beliefs challenged. That's how Puritans viewed liberty. The Mayflower Compact Pact established a system of laws and also that was established by elected representatives. So we see again some early forms of democracy. Natives played an instrumental role in the survival of the pilgrims. They taught them, they taught the pilgrims how to farm and how to fish. And voting was not limited to church members at, at Plymouth. All right, Great Migration in between 1629 and 1642, we have 21,000 Puritans coming over. That is a lot. Many of them come in families. Again, I can't stress this enough. Unlike the French and the Spanish, they tended to come who tended to only send men. Reasons for immigration included religious freedom and economic opportunities. It's the same thing in the 1600s as it is in 2015 or any year in between. Now, the Puritan family, we really see a male-dominated society, and married women had few rights. I've said that several times. I hope that's sinking in. People lived longer than in the Chesapeake. We would see more children, more grandparents, and the establishment of close-knit communities. People lived closer together because there were not plantations. Towns dominated societies, and for every 50 families, a school would be created, and these schools were created to teach the Bible. And Harvard was the first college that was established, and it was established as a ministry college. Men in Massachusetts elected their own governors, people like John Winthrop, who served as governor many times, and in Virginia, those governors were appointed by the crown. Maryland was based on the proprietor, so the proprietor got to appoint the governor. Full church membership required being a visible saint or having a conversion experience and being able to talk about con your conversion experience. And voting was limited to males that were full church members. So it was a small group of society, but there were some elements. But again, that is an element of democracy. All right, let's talk about the bodies of liberties, these listed rights of colonists, and it did allow for slavery. So slavery was seen in the North as well as the South. Ministers could not hold office, although church and state were closely related. And again, Puritans did not believe in religious toleration. They established Massachusetts Bay as a place for them to practice their religion. Now, reasons for banishment from New England, people like Roger Williams and Ann Hutchinson, criticizing the church or violating norms. So let's talk about Roger Williams. He wanted to break away from the Catholic Church or from the Church of England or the Anglican Church. He was a separatist. He believed in complete religious toleration and he challenged the idea that the Puritans were God's chosen people. He's basically calling out the Puritans. So he's kicked out, he's booted, and he forms Rhode Island. Rhode Island established religious freedom, complete religious toleration. There was no established church and no religious requirement for voting. There were more frequent elections, and this meant it was more democratic than Massachusetts. Connecticut, the fundamental words of Connecticut, were based off of Massachusetts, except men could vote without being church members. This is one of the earliest constitutions in, in American history. And Hutchinson was put on trial for her belief. She challenged norms. She led religious discussions at her home and challenged the authorities of ministers. This was radical for anybody to do, but especially for a woman to do. And she was put on trial and banished to Rhode Island in later New York City. Puritans and Indians, many New Englanders believed uncultivated land could be theirs. Some, like Roger Williams, paid natives for land. So Roger Williams was, a, was in the minority of English settlers who paid natives for land. Many Puritans viewed natives as savages due to their religion. We had the Pequot War, which began over the death of a fur trader by Pequots, and New England soldiers defeated them, and many natives were killed or forced into slavery, and they will be forced further west. Colonists began to encroach further onto native land after the victory. And the New England economy, we'll talk about now, very important to know, immigrants came not only for religious motives, but economic motives as well. And the New England economy was mixed. They had some agriculture. They focused a lot on trade. They exported fish and lumber, and they even did some whale hunting as well. There were, very, there were few indentured servants and slaves, although they did exist. All right, the merchant elite trade became a central part of New England colonies, especially sugar and tobacco. And Massachusetts government promoted economic development by building roads and bridges, etc. The halfway covenant was created 
for Puritans because fewer individuals were full church members in Massachusetts. So grandchildren of those who came over during the Great Migration could receive what's known as a halfway membership. So the purpose of this was to increase church membership and grandchildren could become half members essentially. Jeremiads were sermons that gave warning of disaster if people did not return to their religious ways. And this helped encourage New Englanders to come back to church and become more religious. All right, the rights of Englishmen, the Magna Carta in 1215 granted certain liberties by the king. Magna Carta, not this dude Jay-Z, but the king of England. That's a pretty good album, isn't it? It establishes that the due process of law. Colonists viewed themselves as Englishmen. This will be a very important theme leading up to the American Revolution. There was a civil war in England, this conflict between Parliament and the monarchs over the practices resembling Catholicism. Parliament was victorious, so they do what anybody would do. They just behead the King of England. That makes perfect sense, right? Let's just start cutting off heads. Well, that doesn't last very long. Here's poor the poor King Charles getting his head cut off. You can actually, yeah, look at that. That's like blood coming out. That's a bit graphic, huh? Oliver Cromwell ruled England, and in 1660, Charles II assumed the throne. We have new religious groups. They wanted religious toleration. The Levelers were this democratic group that proposed the Constitution, and the ideas would travel to America. Now, Englishmen had more rights and freedoms than other European countries. Many Englishmen saw English colonization better than French or Spanish, which were seen as tyrannical because they had an absolute monarch. Quakers were pacifists that settled in Pennsylvania by this dude, William Penn, and they paid natives for land, and they believed that each person had an inner light. They were not welcome in Massachusetts because they were not Puritans. In Maryland, we see the emergence of a large number of Protestants that sought to gain power, so they create the Maryland Acts of Toleration. Holy cow, know this. This guaranteed religious freedom to all Christians. This is aimed specifically at at protecting Catholics. And this only applies to Christianity. It does not extend to other religions. If you were Jewish, for example, you could receive the death penalty in Maryland. Now, Cromwell led England between 1649 and 1658, and he expanded England's power in Ireland and the Caribbean. And the Navigation Acts were passed in 1651. We'll talk about the next chapter. That is meant to regulate trade. Very, very important. All right, quick recap of this chapter. Church of England, Anglican Church, that is a denomination of Protestantism in which the king has control. Defeat of the Spanish Armada enabled England to emerge as a naval power. England sent men, women, and children. The Chesapeake, no what two colonies make up it. Yep, you know it, Virginia and Maryland. Indenture servants and tobacco early on. The House of Burgesses, first form of representative government. Maryland and Catholicism, tie that in with the Acts of Toleration. City upon a hill, what the heck did John Winthrop mean by that? New England life and towns compared to the Chesapeake. Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson, how were they dissenters? What happened to them? The Pe Pequot War, what was the result of that? Quakers, who were they? Where'd they settle? And finally, the Maryland Acts of Toleration. All right, guys, thank you very much for joining me for Chapter 2. We will see you right back here for Chapter 3, in which this dude, Nathaniel Bacon, he's got a beef, and he leads a rebellion. Did you get it, Nathaniel Bacon beef? Anyway, we'll find out what it is in Chapter 3. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. I look forward to seeing you back here for Chapter 3. Thank you so much, and have a good day.